Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of this year's Different Strokes Annual Conference. Um, thank you all for joining today. So this afternoon, we have um, a special expert Q&A uh, session for, all, um, for everyone, and um, we've got some questions that have been sent in in advance. But before we start, there's just a, a few housekeeping rules that I need to go through. Um, so my name is Ranj, Ranj Palmer. I'm the chair of Different Strokes and I'll be hosting this session this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Bolt, Bird and Kemp for sponsoring this, the event this year and also for running the session earlier on today. I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, the session's being recorded, but the only people and who will be recorded and voices that will be recorded will be myself and the, the rest of the panellists today. So everyone else uh, will not be recorded. Um, there is, within Zoom, there's two functions. Well, there's a, there's a chat function at the bottom of your screen if you're, if you're using a, a, a computer, um, PC or Mac or whatever, um, but also on and um, tablets, there will be a chat function that you can utilize. Um, I see Nikki's just found it as well, so that's great. So that's working. But please feel free to put any comments in the chat function. Um, and myself and, uh, and Austin will be monitoring that throughout um, and hopefully we can get some time towards the end of the session to go through that. Um, if you do have any questions, um, because we've got quite a few questions that have been submitted in advance, um, it might be better to send those questions into info at differentstrokes.co.uk um, and we'll do our best to get those answers back to you. So. Without further ado, let me go straight in and introduce you to the fantastic panel that we have for you today. Um, starting off with Dr. Giles Yates, who's a consultant clinical new neuropsychologist and Tai Chi instructor, who also runs Rippling Minds, Neuroflow, and who chairs the Thames Valley Acquired Brain Injury Forum. Um, John Graham, who founder and clinical director of PhysioFunction, which offer neurological physiotherapy and other services to people with neurological and musculoskeletal conditions. And you'll know, you might, and some of you may well know that they had a session from uh, Claire, one of the neurophysios from Physio Function yesterday, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, we have Melanie Derbyshire, who's an expert in aphasia, formerly of Speakability and the Stroke Association, now CEO of Independence at Home, who are a grant making charity as well as providing consultancy services in the area of aphasia. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Satinda Sengera, who had a stroke age 20, um, which affected her motor, sensory and speech functions, um, as well as leaving her disabled on her right-hand side. And subsequently, she's uh, had a 30-year career in the NHS, including working as a GP and a clinical commissioner. So... Let's dig right into the first question. The first question I have that has been submitted in advance is, how do you deal with depression while suffering with a stroke? And if possible, I'd like to put that to initially to Giles. If you can start a response, please, Giles, come off mute. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. That, that's, <clears throat> I think that's, depression is a word that, many stroke survivors use to describe their experience. And I think from a, as a psychologist perspective, I always like to move beyond that word to think about people's actual lived experience, what's happening for you, what are the reasons. We know that um, depression, depressed mood, low mood, is something that is very common following stroke. There, there is definitely a biological element to that. And there's also the psychological and adjustment um, aspect to that, the, um, the changes in self-concept and identity, the adjustment to changed abilities, the change experience of perhaps a body that is um, different in its capability, um, a breakdown of relationships, social isolation, all of these things, there may be one or many of these things all co-occurring together that can leave people in a very hopeless um, place 
and these feelings can get stuck. And I guess that's when the word like depression is, is used and, and it kind of alerts everyone that perhaps someone needs some assistance. So, so given all of that, each person's depression is going to be different, right? Um, as a, 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 I suppose a common um, generic piece of advice that, that is a thread that um, is in a lot of my work supporting survivors um, with low mood is to think about building yourself up slowly. So a core image I use is that you're a little fledgling sapling sapling coming out of the ground and you could easily be crumpled. So people try and do things that are too much too soon. And that, you know, think of the word depress, you depress a lever, you push down. So the weight, the crushing weight of a difficult experience can come down too thick and fast. Whereas what we want to do is take incremental steps so that little sapling becomes a strong oak tree and has more resilience and can weather the bigger demands. So it may be about increasing activity very slowly where the things that you do give you some happy hits back and you can, and as you get those happy hits, you can feel a bit more bolstered and then you can attempt more challenging tasks. Those tasks could be around self-care and independence. Those tasks could be around dealing with people and, um, you know, bringing people back into your life. I think relationships are important. Surround yourself with people who fill you with positive energy, don't drain you or sap energy from you, or they may be okay people, but they're just too daunting to be around. So, so I think some of those ideas, it's really hard to know about um, journeying with a specific person and finding out what depression is for them, but find experiences, activities, relationships with others that give you imagine you're like a little um, a battery bar on a phone mine's a bit low at the minute, you know so think about how to get a charge and get that incrementally going up and as it goes up you can attempt more things and and the the more demanding things or the bigger experiences give you more energy back and so you can those that's your stepping stone but a big problem is people try and do the big things too quickly and there's a big rebound and they get crushed before they're ready so I hope some of those ideas are useful. That's great, Giles. That's really, really good. Um, John, any, you'd like to comment on, on that from a maybe physio perspective? I, I know that the last 18, 20 months or so have been um, incredibly difficult for, for a lot of stroke survivors with, with the feeling of isolation and, and because of the because of the pandemic, but and they've not been able to do their physios phys, uh, in physically, i.e. with the physio in, in the room. Do you think that's had a, um, a an effect on depression as well and mood? Yeah, I think I think when that when you're getting that that boost um, from f physical activity, especially if it's supervised, you're um, that's a, a really positive a really positive thing. Um, and I think as as a, as a group of individuals, I think you know, we are kind of often larger than life and, and bristling with positivity. So if you're if you kind of thought a better word, feeding off feeding off that and that's your regular regular hit then to have that dramatically taken away over the last 18 months is is, is quite tough um i don't know how, how many folks that the, the, the listening have, have been joining in with the the regular uh, facebook live exercise streaming that uh we've all been doing through 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 different strokes because that's a really great way no matter what your level of ability um to to engage in in exercise um and often, I'm, I'm sure um, Satinda will, will sort of back me up on that, 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 that it's recognised that the role of exercise in, the, in helping with, um, with depression is quite, is quite important. So um, I would say for, for those people that haven't found the classes on the Facebook, have a look at see, see if you can find the different strokes classes. There's a big, there's a big uh, library of those. And we've designed it in such a way as there are various levels. So right the way down to if, if you're unable to um if you, if you will totally dependent on your wheelchair there are still lots of exercises that we've, we've put in there um for you to do up to people that are, are at the, the far fitter end that have not been able to do their their park runs or, or whatever there's lots of challenging ones in um in there but ex exercise very important for for mental health and, de and, and depression and i think that's probably the easiest way through different strokes to um to access it 
And like Giles was saying about the do the big thing, don't don't go for boom or bust and suddenly you know download all those exercises and do four hours <laughs> today this evening and then wonder why the weekend doesn't happen for you. Yeah, no, exactly. Wise words. Satinda, can I bring you in there as well? You're on mute. Sorry. I wish I'd had John and Giles in my life when I had my stroke in 1986. Unfortunately, I was the boom and bust uh, stroke survivor. So, um, but hey ho. What, what I would say is um, for me, there, unfortunately, when I had my stroke in 1986, mental health wasn't a thing, disability wasn't a thing. So uh, there was certainly a lot of uh, stigma and prejudice uh, directed directly towards me on lots of levels, race, sex, disability, the whole lot really, from professionals as well as peers. Um, so, but, so I didn't really have any kind of um, input regarding mental health when, during my, until, after my divorce actually sort of 20 odd years later um what I did at the time how I hooked myself up by my breeches and and sort of threw myself back at life was I was fortunate that I had a family that were very positive um and anybody who came to see me because I was in hospital for four months who was negative draining, said, oh, I know somebody and they died or whatever. My mum just used to kick them out. So that was great. I had that sort of positivity and support. My family didn't see me as disabled, so they never made life easy for me. Um, so in a way that helped because they didn't um, try and cotton wool me and make me feel like I had sort of problems. Um, and it made me push myself uh, and, I often found that by doing that, you adapt. And when you learn how to adapt, then you start to feel a bit less negative and a bit more positive. So I found that helped. I had lots of problems with returning to an environment, which you'll all relate to, whether it's work or whatever. I returned to medical school and um, I was a very different person because I was a county runner before. I was like always out clubbing up all night. Uh, burning the candle and I was very sociable social animal and I returned a very different beast you know I would like take me ages just to walk up and down the stairs and I, I couldn't speak properly and I, I was having to relearn using my non-dominant hand and and obviously all the brain fog and everything that goes with that and and I found that my one thing that was difficult was um, people looking at you and comparing you to how you are before and that can have a real impact on your mental health because, you know, you, it, it doesn't do anything, as Giles said, it just kind of keeps depressing you, you know. So what I did is I actually um, managed to get a grant and I actually went and worked abroad in Malawi uh, and I ended up on a campsite um, uh, within two years of disability, still carrying disability. And it struck me, I was in a completely different world, very different environment. Nobody knew me as they previously remembered me. And actually I was sort of just doing my work, you know, as a medical student out there. And that's what they saw. And because that's what I projected, that's what they picked up on. And suddenly I wasn't also tinder to the person who used to be X, Y, Z. It was this person who was like almost newborn, who was, um, finding a way and realizing that a lot of people's perceptions of you is down to how you project yourself and I really learned that in Malawi that because I felt like I was nobody knew me I felt a little bit more confident and it just made me realize that actually a lot of my depression or what I didn't realize was depression at the time it was only after I looked at photos and realized I was wearing black all the time <laughs> But what it made me realise was that it was simply because of the way I was projecting myself. I was, you know, I was conscious of the way I walked, of the, of the way my arm was held and all these things. And it made me feel very, and, and, I, and that's all I kept focusing on. So, oh, I need to hide myself, hide myself. But in this place, I realised that if you project you as you actually are, not the person that's carrying different aspects now than before, 
then that is what people pick up that they perceive your positivity your personality and they're more interested in that and they and then suddenly they realize the rest of your body but it's not that what they notice first straight away and I found that throughout my life that if you're if you just be yourself if you surround yourself by positive people if you are comfortable in your skin and you are aware of yourself but you don't keep putting yourself down then you will mentally feel more positive inside you know you really will so it's about liking yourself and more than that loving yourself and accepting yourself you know and definitely all the things about exercise sleep diet all these things very much feed into it but that's more medical um, but I, I wanted to talk to you about it from the stroke survivors perspective Thank you for that, Satinda. Uh, Melanie, do you, any, anything to add? Yeah, so I, I just really, I mean, I agree with everything, and I thought Satinda summed up some really good um, things there. But when people have um, the stroke to contend with, and they may have visual impairment, other impairment, and aphasia or other communication difficulties, it, it can be quite natural to feel low one can understand that you have a sense of loss. It, it is described sometimes as a bereavement and inevitably that will take its toll and people will feel low. And that can, as Giles was explaining, that can grow and grow and become something more serious. So it is important that individuals do take care of themselves that they allow themselves, allow yourself to, to feel like that. It's natural. It's not that you've done anything and it's not something that you can switch on and off. It doesn't work like that. And I know sometimes well-meaning friends and family do think you can switch it on and off. Um, but what I like to focus on with the people that I work with is the fact that you can do things to support yourself. So we've talked a little bit about health. Well, if you have aphasia or if you have any cognitive difficulties, it's really important to stay hydrated. And drinking tea and coffee isn't the answer because that dehydrates you. If you think about it, if you've ever been to Europe, and I know it's probably a few years ago now, when they serve you a coffee, they give you a glass of water at the same time. There's a reason for that, because coffee and tea and other drinks like that are dehydrating. So what I say to people in is if, if you have a glass of water in every room and when you go into that room, just take a sip, you start to rehydrate yourself. And that gives your brain the best possible chance of functioning. So it's a really important thing to remember. And then there's the other things, things like getting out into nature, taking exercise, if you can, joining one of the different strokes exercise classes or using one of the videos. But think about music as well. Now, early on, people with aphasia find it difficult to listen to music sometimes. But if you can, think about music and singing and humming I have a, a, a group that plays the kazoo. We call ourselves the Kazoo Orchestra. But even something like that can lift us. It can lift us and give us a different energy. Uh, certainly doodling and drawing and um, anything that involves colour. And that's another tip, I think, which does work for some people. If you're sitting in a small room, a flat or a studio, and you're not outside because you've had a stroke or you're unwell, then having some colour in the room can really make a difference. Uh, I always used to take my mother after her stroke, a lovely bunch of yellow tulips or yellow flowers, because as soon as they were in the vase, they lifted the whole room. And you'll notice that I always wear coloured scarves because that helps me to feel in the mood that I want to be in. So think about the colour that you're living in. If you're living in a, a, a sort of plain creamy colour, that probably isn't going to help you with your mood. And I think it's really important to surround yourselves with people that do give you that positive energy. 
And so you can, uh, through different strokes, obviously you can access the groups, but you might also just get together in between groups or online with special friends that you've met through those groups. You don't always have to meet at the group. You could actually have other friendships as well. And then there's all the stuff online. Sometimes when you're struggling with something, a big thing that's happened in your life, it can be helpful to find out as much as you can about it. So use the Different Strokes website, Stroke Association website, use other things like that to find out information and to learn more, because by learning more, you can take control better. I think just lastly, I would say that if you're struggling and you want more help with getting online, there are now um, books and resources and videos um, that Stroke Association, when I was there, we made for people with aphasia and they're all freely available. So check them out if you want to do more online to help you link up with people. Uh, one little addition, sorry, is well. fatigue. Uh, when fatigue is unchecked, it's like a bottomless pit, that's a, a black hole that sucks everything out, including positive energy. So sometimes when someone's not managing the fatigue, the potential, the risk for depression can, can really be exacerbated. So checking in on rest uh, and activity moderation can really help with boosting mood as well. Brilliant. Thank you for that, guys. Really appreciate it. I'm going to move on to the second question. Um, where do I turn to get support for the invisible side, the psychological impact and cognitive deficits? And Satinda, can I start with you initially on that one, please? Again? Yeah, I'll figure it out <laughs> eventually, by the end, by the last question. Yeah. So this is a very yeah. difficult question at this point in time because of this pandemic and the resources it's putting on the NHS. I'll be honest about that. You know, it's... Uh, nothing is freely and easily available, but there are um, mental health services and lines that you uh, through channels through which you can go if you need psychological support. In terms of the invisible side of stroke, the invisible side is very specific to individual people. Um, I think for me, it was uh, around self-esteem um, and it was around fatigue you know, particularly, but I think it depends on the environment you're in as to whether you can be open about it or not. With me, certainly in the environment I was in and the times I was in, I couldn't. And so in terms of the support I received, I didn't receive any in the terms of support, support which is available now. Um, you have things like different strokes, you have the Stroke Association, you also have uh, local uh, forums and groups available in your area. Um, in, from GP practices, uh, you can have access to, to physiotherapy, to mental health services. There's occupational therapy as well, which can often give you good advice about how to tackle some of those areas which you struggle with uh, in terms of physical and cognitive function as well. Uh, often a, a support service that's forgotten about occupational therapists have a lot to offer um, and I, I think the invisible side of stroke is it's such a difficult thing to talk about because most people it's about how you feel about your stroke that makes you feel invisible you know um, I found that actually quite a challenging question to answer uh, to be honest um, because I think it's so individual for people. Some apologies, I, I don't really know which direction to take that question in specifically from a GP perspective. That's, that's, uh, <clears throat> so it, is, it is a very difficult question to answer and it's something that is very, very specific to, to each and every person. I mean, uh, um, I'm, I'm a stroke survivor myself and I, there's, you know, to look at me you you would think there's nothing wrong with me people don't really realize that I've, I've i've had a stroke and it's only when you have to explain the fact that you you know you struggle with neuro fatigue a lot and so running sessions and doing work on computers is is something that 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 you struggle with that's when people kind of do get it but then they they tend to forget it as well giles can i ask you to come in on that one 
Yeah, it's interesting because <clears throat> when stroke survivors um, speak with a, a clinical psychologist, neuropsychologist like myself, <clears throat> it's often because of the invisible difficulties, be it cognitive or mental health. The other category would be relationships and the breakdown of relationships. That's often something that's not easily seen. And I suppose they stand in contrast to maybe some of the physical changes of um, following stroke that are quite visible. And if there's progress in mobility, physical abilities, that, <clears throat> that attracts all of the attention at the beginning. But the, the cognitive <clears throat> and mental health and relationship comes to brain injury may only become more apparent um, maybe a bit later on. And because they can't be seen, <clears throat> it's hard to gather around a group of people to help you with it. <clears> that they all, they all, they all are real, and they all have potential strategies <clears throat> and ways of dealing with them. In the same way that a a, a physical change um, would benefit from strategies as well. So the first thing it all starts in having a conversation with someone who takes you seriously, who um, can signpost you to um, resources and information. Other people who've had similar experiences, yes, this is a real thing, you know, this is what's helped me, um, you know, and, and then there's a professional perspective on that, and then there's like the, um, the peer perspective on that, you know, Different Strokes has the peer befriending scheme for young stroke survivors, 16 to 25 year olds, where there's that, the voice of someone else who's gone through that as well. So having kind of the lived the experts by experience, the live experience saying, yes, that's a real thing. I have that. Many people have that. that the normalizing validation is important. Um, I do think compared to say acquired brain injury services, stroke services have been a bit slower on the uptake to prioritize psychological changes, cognitive changes, um, but um, they're getting better. So it, definitely their rehabilitation goals in, in and of themselves. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for that, Giles. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're kind of halfway through, so I'm going to move on, if, if it's OK, to the, to the next question. Um, and the next question, John, I want to start with you for, with this one, if possible. Um, it's about physical rehab. So how can ongoing physical rehab be supported, given every stroke survivor's recovery is different and there is no fixed time scale? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great it's a great question. Um, there's a few there's a few strands a few strands that I mean one of one of the things I often chat to people about is, is the fact that after you know in, in the initial period following a following with um, a stroke that your that, that's the first three to six months is often the, the, a, a rapid period of, of recovery but often that's the brain recovery and the swelling resolving the real uh, changes when you're relearning the old activities tends to be after the three to six month period and at that time you're only ever using good you know unaffected parts of your brain to either relearn tasks you were able to do before or to learn to learn new tasks so in terms of the time scale uh, I, I, I think it's, it, it's open-ended but in a really good way you never stop um, having the, the you know the opportunity to to make physical physical improvements in terms of how you how you're doing that again uh, we're, I'm really excited that, that we embarked on this project with Austin over the uh, and different strokes over the summer with those online um, exercise classes because we're building up just such a good library there uh, that I don't think you, could, you, you you won't be able to access to anywhere else. It's 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 a fabulous um, library of exercises that actually because we've we've stratified it into a level one people that are predominantly dependent on a wheelchair gradually two three four five up to five where you might be someone who who would do a park do a park run um or be you know not as fast as you, you might have done prior to your prior to your stroke you've actually got a sequential exercise program from level one to level five now, for some people they, they're going to they might they may well sail through that in a matter of weeks other people may be months or um or even years but there is a there is kind of a pathway there backed up with hopefully the return uh, to some of the face-to-face -face stuff in, in exercise uh, classes as part of different strokes. The other thing is there are, um, to look, in the community, I mean, 
as the swimming pools get open, you've got your aqua aerobics, which I, I, I'm a big fan of, if people who, who do like their water. Um, you've got your the health walks, and people do those at various levels um, of ability. And like Tizian was something that Melanie was saying, which is really important about getting, getting the outdoor, um, outdoor uh, experience. Um, I was just thinking whether just to sort of tell a little story, I, I was trying to get a background picture to, to one of my uh, stroke survivors. This is, this is Andy. Now, Andy, I think in reality is probably someone who has gone from perhaps not level one when we first saw him, but certainly level two, a very shaky transfer and just about able to manage a few, um, a few steps. And he, he had his stroke in 2012. I started seeing him in 2012. Uh, 13 and he was and it comes back to what Giles was saying about having a goal so his goal when he could barely walk was to go to the desert and do set six marathons so we had we had to kind of modify that so we sort of we because we, so we said well if you're first we've got to get you actually beyond walking from your car into my clinic we've got to kind of get you walk you know walk around the block get some fresh air, set the lamppost by lamppost goals. So then from that, um, we then found a, he, wanted, he needed a challenge. So the challenge, we said, okay, in six months time, we're gonna do the London to, to Paris bike race on a tandem. So the, we had a, some very interesting initial cycles out on a tandem where I thought it was gonna kill us, kill us both. Um, in fact, while I was trying to learn how to, one of my able-bodied cycling friends will never get on a tandem with me again after one after one experience. But this guy's brave, so we did. We you know we did it. We did it in six months training, and again we, we could only manage around the block the first few times out, and and then we did it. Which is worth uh, worth saying. There's a great charity called Charlotte's Tandems who will rent you a tandem um, to have a go with to see if you know to see if that's for, for you as a form of exercise with a with a partner. And that, but this was still in the back of his mind. So it took us another three years of different strokes exercises in Northampton of regular gym exercise. But eventually we got him out for two, for two marathons in the Sahara Desert in 2017, some, some five years um, after his stroke. And this is him stood on a, uh, on a sand dune. He's got a splint because he's, he's got a foot drop. Um, so, yeah, so I think... It, 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 it's it's open-ended time scale, but I think that's a positive. You know, you, you don't stop. I think Claire, for those of you who tapped in yesterday, will have talked about plateaus. It's a term that drives me crazy because a plateau in, 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 as a sort of one-time mountain climber myself, it's a flat area before you start going up again. Um, so I think we're, we should always be aiming for our, 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 various, our various summits. But that's, yeah, I think it's probably as thorough answer I can give for the moment on that. I hope that's helpful. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Uh, anyone else want to come in on, 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 the, on that physical rehab side of things? Yes, please. I do. Um, you know, definitely want to come in on this one because there is, to be honest, um, you, you will keep going up and down, up and down, and then up, 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 and then maybe after 30 years, when you've done too much, you might go a little bit down, but then most people do just through the aging process, but then you pull yourself back up. So, you know, you, you certainly don't plateau, that's for sure. And you will get out of your body what you put into it. And that's been my experience. You will definitely, and always aim for more than you think you can aim for, because you will actually be surprised how much you can achieve. You might have to adapt. So I was a runner, but I became a swimmer and I do front crawl and okay it's badly but I do it and I get a great sense of freedom from that and it's been good for my sort of um, bilateral function as well as well as my well-being I do you can do I mean I have no active movement below my knee but I still manage to go do sort of three-day hikes and treks carrying all my own gear um, and you just sort of work you know you find how you how to protect your foot from undue damage um you know um i do sailing i do sea swimming i climb mountains i have climbed mountains and i still do you know there's all sorts of things you can do and i remember i i run a different i run a, a charity locally for disabled adults mostly with stroke and all of them come 
saying that they cannot do uh, a number of physical things. But through a bit of um, encouragement, they always end up doing more. And part of it is just that they have dumbed down their expectation of what their limits are. I think generally people, humans do that anyway. We all tend to dumb down uh, what we're really capable of, which is why we're always so surprised when you hear those stories of amazing people who've done you know, 20 marathons in a row. But actually human beings, disability are not are, are capable of a lot more than you think. I mean, with severe disability, I completed a, a very demanding medical training and went into the sort of uh, junior jobs with 100 hour weeks you know, and I would have bleeding toes at the end of it. But, you know, I survived all that and actually thrived on it in a way. So you can do more than you think you can do. And I've seen that also with other stroke survivors who've attended my local charity and and the, the, the self-esteem they get from realizing they can walk further, they can, you know, I had a lady in her, in her 70s who slept downstairs, her husband slept upstairs, encouraged her to get a private physio sort of four years after a stroke to try and encourage her to try and do the stairs she did manage it and now she sleeps next to her husband and so you never need you should never give up um and also you don't have to do sorry apologies to the physios um it doesn't have to be a perfect movement okay i didn't use my right arm this one that i'm holding up for the help of my other one the way that i was supposed to and it drove the physios mad but I adapted and I decided I wasn't going to get it to work in the way it was supposed to work. I was just going to get it to work so that I could function, so I could do my minor surgery, so I could do all my digging the garden and, and doing all my walking and, and so forth. You know, I decided to adapt as you can um, to make it function for the purpose that I wanted it to be useful for. You know, so you decide on something that floats your boat that makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and work your body around that. And it might not be the right way of moving it, but if you can get it moving, that's better than nothing at all. And stretch as well, really, really important. I can tell you this after 30, 35 years of stroke that, you know, imagine if you don't stretch those muscles that naturally want to contract themselves they're going to shorten they're going to tighten you're going to become more and more lopsided so make sure that you invest in stretching those tight flexors out because otherwise that will cause you a lot of damage and pain and then you will reduce your mobility so you can do more than you think you can but make sure you do things based on a goal that gives you pleasure and work away around that and remember to, as well as all the, you know, the exertion to stretch it all out as well. Yeah, it's going to add to that as a Tai Chi instructor as well, in defense of um, physical movements that are not goal focused in terms of um, improving um, a, a, an outcome um, around physical movement. Some physical movements make you feel good and just being in a space of moving and breathing and stretching just feels good for the period of time in which you're doing it. And that's a great reason to be moving. Giles, can you just can you just talk a little bit more about the Tai Chi side of things? Because I know that that's been a huge benefit for a lot of stroke survivors. Um, yeah, we were, we're just coming to a conclusion. We've just been, we're just, um, our last session, uh, session 67 goes out next week. And for about a year and a quarter, we've been running online Tai Chi groups to, par to parallel the exercise groups and the challenge there is um, having different um, adaptations so that everyone can participate and the main thing is that I come to see that it's people have different doorways different ways to get into the same state of mind which is being in a state of flow flowing with the breath and the movements which has enormous benefits it feels immediately good it holds you together it takes you to a that takes you away from your worries. But each person's doorway into that state of mind is different. Some people it's standing practice, some people it's seated, some people it's using half of their body, some people it's using bilateral movements. So it's finding the right fit for you. Ideas of flow talk about a fit between, the right balance between challenge um, and accessibility. And it's finding that fit for you. But people say, I need to do this to improve my walking. 
but maybe but you, you can do it just because it feels good and that's a really important distinction as well from a tai chi perspective thank you yeah, john and sorry. john yeah i mean i i i share satinder's frustration with some of my colleagues who uh, kind of you know if it's not perfect don't do it so well actually it's movement towards i mean i use a golfing analogy at the end of the day you know the final goal is to get the silly white ball in the hole but as long as that first stroke from a few hundred miles away, a few hundred yards away, is in the general direction of the hole, you're going the right way. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, if it's gone backwards in the car park, not you know, not so good. And the and the, and game with Giles is, is is answer. The body has a great capacity to inform. So if it's less than perfect and it doesn't make you feel tighter and it doesn't hurt and it does make you feel better and the movement felt felt good, that's your inner. That's your that's the key that you're on the right the right tracks i think we get as physios one of the challenges that the school of, of, of rehabilitation that we kind of use as part of our training historically has been over prescriptive if it's, if it's got to be this this way but i'm i'm balanced with satinda if, if you can do it then it feels right you you know you do it move so slightly awkward movement is better for you than um the no the no movement the other, the other thing is, is, is uh, looking at not just the, the physical, the exercises, is the thing is, the thing, talking from my sort of AT colleagues, looking at uh, a craft activities, because they're, they're often something that will involve uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of movement. I, I, I sort of, during lockdown, honed my, my, my sourdough baking skills um, and then started looking at, well, hang on a minute, this is a really gentle way of making bread. You know, I don't need two hands to do it can i adapt it and can i teach one, some of my, my my stroke survivors to make to make really tasty bread with one hand so i, I kind of used used my used that time and we, we've, we've done it and we've, 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 we've taken a few people through some bread making and what was really interesting was not only did they did, did they get really excited and, and positive about i've created something here this, that my friends and family are going to eat and and enjoy and even though they were doing it with with effectively the side that wasn't wasn't affected, they were doing such a novel activity and having dough sticking to their hands, they just loved it. And I didn't, I just didn't see that coming. It was it was a wonderful sort of uh, surprise that actually just a simple doing a novel movement with with the good hand and putting it in an awkward sticky sticky places. They they loved it. So I think yeah. So I'm, I think another part of, of physical activity is looking looking at crafts that you can uh, that you can. Uh, you can do and that's where YouTube comes back in in again another one of our stroke survivors he uh, he's had a, a brainstem stroke so he has one functional limb just a, 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 a one arm and it's his legs aren't are too hot one arm and again it's a little it's 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 not it's not perfect and I, he's 15 years post and over the last six months he's suddenly he is locked down he suddenly decided to do pictures was doing using a dotted pen and he's then progressed that where he buys jute bags and then he'll copy a, a photograph so if you he's done one of my physio's dogs he's done he, he did a, a, a car logo for me and these are just pinpricks but he's got to lean forward he's using everything and then he creates something that's absolutely absolutely beautiful takes takes a really long time does it matter no is it is a beautiful result at the at the end, so he's kind of ticking all those boxes. He's getting productivity, creativity, um, movement, and, and and something at the end that brings not only him joy but the joy to the people that he and he passes them passes them on to. I think that's a that's a great example of um, post stroke a stroke survivor finding their thing, the thing that you know that that, that does it for them, that enables them to get a, a level of satisfaction. It doesn't have to be employment, voluntary employment, whatever. It just has to be something that they enjoy, they go back to, um, and whether they realise it or not, it's helping them to kind of recover and rehab as well at the same time. I think that's a brilliant example. I want to move on, um, unfortunately, because we we are we not got that long left. But so the next question, um, Giles, I think I'd like to start with you with this. The the cause for my severe stroke at forty six years old was never found. It worries me that it might happen again, as I don't know the reason. How do you deal with the fear of another stroke? And we, I get this question. We do a lot of stroke uh, ward visits, and I get this question a lot. 
Um, is there something that you can kind of help with that? Is there something you can say? Yeah, that, that fear, that, that, that doubt and that uncertainty, that's huge, isn't it? And that's something that's really hard to live with because many people who have not had a life-changing illness or accident just are kind of in a bit of invincibility mode and it won't happen to me and of course then it's happened to you and does that mean it's going to happen again and and can you take anything for granted but then the anxiety around that can become bigger than the actual index neurological event so it's really hard I, I think obviously getting as much medical reassurance as possible from a medic is is key and getting things checked out and, and whenever I'm working with people from the anxiety perspective around um, symptoms or, or things that might be indicators of, you know, warning signs for future stroke. We get the, me the medical side checked out first. And I think the uh, one source of reassurance is that it's actually, it's on the map now. It's in the spotlight. The first time it happened, no one was watching, you know, for, for the most case. Now there's a whole kind of system around you monitoring things, looking at risk factors. So immediately that's going to reduce the risk. And again, it depends on the stroke, it depends on the underlying conditions. But I think the fact that people are monitoring is a source of reassurance um, and knowing how to manage the anxiety element of it, with some of the things we always talk about breathing, things is, is, is a way of feeling it, and that you can actively manage what largely feels out of your control. Thank you, Giles. Anyone else? Any other comments from anyone else? I mean, I guess the I, I, ties a bit with what Melanie was saying the importance of you know the importance of hydration. If it's kind of you know one of the things that you can do to protect yourself is is, is maintain hydration because that's where you are, if you're dehydrated that's you know where you are going to be risk of um, sort of you know th thickening of the blood. Um, the other thing, I, I went to a presentation a few years ago where they were, they were talking about fear just as an idea, and, one of the, and they, they presented it as an acronym, which is a false expectations appearing real, which I really like. So you've had a stroke, they don't know what the cause has ever been found, but conversely, it's kind of meaning there's nothing obvious there to mean you'd have another one. They've looked, not there. So keep hydrated and then just think, False expectation. It's, it's a false expectation. It's not going to happen. Potentially, it's not going to happen again. But it appears, it appears real. Thank you, John Satinde. Yes. Um, I mean, I don't know what the cause of my stroke was, um, and I'll be honest, I didn't really think I was going to have another one because I was too busy deciding what my purpose and meaning in life was going to be. And I think that would help if you, you know, if you focus on what you want to do here and now, um, because. We don't, none of us know when our time is up. Um, I didn't think I would live beyond 50 because of other health issues that occurred, but here I am at 55. And I would rather live a life where, and I think most people I've come across would rather live a life where they feel that they had a life well lived with what they have than spend a large amount of that time fearing what might come. That's, and we also know from scientific evidence that people with chronic health conditions who fear a recurrence of their chronic health condition, whatever it might be, they are more likely to have a recurrence of that chronic health condition because fear and anxiety cause physiological changes in your body, which can increase your risk of having those very events. So you need to be mindful of that. And what I do and what I make a point of doing throughout my last 35 years is being aware that I have increased risk factors because I had a, a major CVA. And so I concentrated on remaining as fit as I can, on eating the right kind of food, thousand percent about the, the water. You know, I have a, a two liter bottle that I make sure I get through every day. Um, and uh, try, making sure you sleep, thinking about your mindfulness and well-being, doing things you enjoy, being around positive people, you know, um, these are all the things that everybody needs to be doing, you know, because there are a lot of people living with chronic conditions and cancers who, who fear recurrence. And my experience as a GP is the ones who crack on with life, 
and make the most of the time they have are less likely to then have a recurrence of an event. Thank you, Satinda. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, Melanie, and this is this is one for you. I, um, well, the area I want to start with is, is is for you, the communication side, but it's a really open ended um, million dollar question. How long does it take to recover? Yeah, and how long is a piece of string? It's, it's a, a fascinating uh, question. So the first thing I would say is if you're talking about a stroke and if you're talking about aphasia, it takes as long as it takes. And in some respects, I suppose it's fair to say that I'm not sure you ever do get to 100%. It's something that people worry about and people talk about. But um, uh, an analogy that comes to me is when people are doing a rally, the first thing a rally driver does when he leaves the spot is to knock off both wing mirrors and turn his uh, re rear view mirror around. And what he does is he focuses on driving to the end. And I think that's what people need to do. Uh, it's much more uh, helpful to focus on how you're going to live the, the rest of your life than to worry about how long it's going to take and whether you've reached each milestone. But I think, I mean, what we do know is that people make a recovery all the time and every day you are changing and recovering in some way. And I think sometimes with aphasia, it's a good idea to actually keep a kind of diary or get your family member to help you with that so that you chart what you were able to do today because then when you look back you'll see that you've actually progressed quite a lot but if we don't chart it we don't have any point of reference so I think the the short answer from my perspective is I've seen people recover over five months ten months one year, 10 years, five years, 20 years, 25 years, and it continues. And the, the most important thing is to focus on the future and make sure you're going as far as you can. Thank you, Melanie. And John, from a physio perspective, you know, the, <coughs> these, I still get told this nowadays, but by, you know, the consultants are telling patients and stroke survivors that, you know what, you, you, your recovery you, you, is kind of maxed out. And you, this is pretty much your, you know, your job lot. Like we can't see you getting much better. But do you see recovery physically years yeah. afterwards? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's the one that just, that's the one that drives me, the, one of the biggest frustrations because it's, it's, a, it's the big lie. And what mm. we are actually being told you're as good as our current um, resources will allow you to get. That's what they're really saying, but they can't mm. say that. Um, and I've had a couple of physio colleagues who, who, had, who, who did say that and got into a lot of trouble for it. Um, so in reality, it's, recovery is potentially is, is, is lifelong. And the, 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 other, the analogy I often say to people is, look, you know, it may have been that you were you were at work and you were looking forward to retire at 65 and you'd promised yourself that at 65 you would learn to play golf, for argument's sake. Well, given that we can learn totally new motor skills in our later twilight twilight years, you know, the body is always capable of, of, of learning. So it's it's a it's a lifelong, we're only ever using. The, the unaffected part of the brain to relearn stuff that we did before and to learn to learn new to learn new skills and and on the same time scale as, as, as Melanie said we've you know we've we've seen people who've who've made recoveries two five ten fifteen um, twenty years past I mean that the fellow Andy that I showed you know folk earlier so that that was 2017 two days in the desert where well, he's now training for the Everest base camp. So that's nearly nearly ten years after his stroke, and he's getting stronger. He's getting fitter. And interestingly, from from uh, from an aphasia point of view, when I when I first met him in in two twelve two thirteen, he very he could pretty much he struggled to to get consistent yes and and, and no um, on its own, let alone more complex sentences. 
he's now he, prior to his stroke he was a, a motorcycle racing instructor now some nine years later he's rejoined that circuit and is working with young uh, motorcyclists on on coaching them uh, motorcycle skills and getting some and helping them get some nice nice results so he's gone and it's taken years and years and years and practice and commitment but year by year he's made improvements in his speech such like i say he's now teaching but i do a, a, a handy memory reminder from melly as well diarize it get put put your little success things on because at your it ties almost back into the depression thing we spoke about earlier at your lowest ebb if you're thinking oh come so i'm just as bad as i was six months ago okay well no hang on a minute six months ago you weren't able to do to do this and you've got your chart you've got your you've got your highlights so it, that can feed into lots of lots of things so i think your yeah, charting i think is really um is, is a really important thing and diarizing thank you john uh satinda anything you want to add to that yeah, I think, well, your recovery definitely goes on for life because I feel I'm I'm fitter and stronger than when I was working full time. Um, you know, I think and that's partly because that was partly down to investing time in yourself, but also your state of mind. You know, as I've got older, I think coming out the other side of the menopause, actually, I'm much less bothered about what people think about me. And I think that's made a huge difference you know, to me personally, and I, I've seen that with patients as well, that, you know, when people are comfortable in their own skin, and they're not trying to be this and be that and keep up with X, Y, and Z, then they just tend to be, hold themselves better, they spend more time looking after themselves, and all these things can be lifelong. And what's also nice at my age, is all my mates who were doing their fell runs and their triathlons and whatever a lot of them have got more knackered joints than me now because they've been overdoing it for the last 30 years so I feel like I've kind of caught up with everybody and I'm on my upstroke and they're all on their downstroke because they've not been looking after themselves you know so I have the benefit of knowing my body and, and listening to it so I think to be honest keep yourself going and at some point you'll find you'll overtake everybody all the supposedly able-bodied people who are going to start going downhill because disability is only really a state of mind, you know. Um, I know a lot of able-bodied people who are extremely disabled and extremely non-functioning. And so, yes, definitely recovery is for life. I mean, you know, I still do as much as I did when I was, you know, before my stroke, apart from being able to run, you know, in terms of stamina and activities, you know, I, you can drag your body through 35 years of significant disability and and have a hell of a life out of it as well so there's no limit thank you except, thank the, one you you put, except the one you put on yourself <laughs> thank you um the final question for today Giles I'd like to if you could start with a response on this one um how do I learn to accept the fact that I will never be the same person that I used to be pre-stroke Again, that's a really complicated one, isn't it? How we define ourselves. Um, <clears throat> some people have only one egg in the basket and that defines them. And if they're unable to resume that role, then they're not that person anymore. Um, other people, you know, it, some people, it's a real embodied sense of being different in their own body or their personality has essentially changed, or other people are seeing that. And it, it's really difficult. I think what what runs through all of those is the thread of continuity. Find some continuous way to pick up um, where you left off at the point of the stroke. And that could be picking that thread and taking it in a new direction, but it's continuous to what was important or what defined you before. It may be that you're able to get back into that, or it may be that, yeah, you become a better person than you were before. Um, a lot of men, I, um, for example, I support, I do a lot of couples therapy and a lot of men in the couples work I do after stroke have learned to become vulnerable and learn to reach out from a position of vulnerability. And they find that their relationships with their lovers or whatever is enriched because of that. Whereas before they were a self-contained island that didn't need any help from anyone. And that actually made them a bit inaccessible in their lives before. So who you are comes, that's, that doesn't stop. 
you perform, you do identity, you construct your identity from so many different facets, so many different Lego blocks of life. So where things got disrupted or severed by the stroke, where are you going to take that thread forward again? How can you pick it up maybe in a new direction, maybe um, defining yourself similar values, similar issues, but in a different way now? Thank you, Giles. Um, anyone else want to add some comments, John? Yeah, I think one of, one of the things that's kind of, I, I, I'll, I'll reveal prior to being a physio, I was a psychologist. Um, one of the things that's kind of interested me is this, this, this emerging kind of research into um, post-traumatic growth, how actually rather than being the person you were, you had the potential to, to recreate and be, you know, be completely different, if not transform the stroke can in in some ways be be transformational at creating the new uh, the new you so, you so looking at it as an opportunity to re to rewrite the um the, the the script as it were um off off slightly off piece there is on on the subject of um post-traumatic growth there is, there's a a film called phil's camino and the camino is the is a pilgrim's walk in in spain and there's a, an American guy who was recovering from, uh, uh, well, he had terminal terminal cancer, and he had um, uh, was really run down with um, with the chemo. So not unlike the, the exhaustion and fatigue that one would, would would associate with post post stroke. And he got a bit obsessed with this Camino. So he worked out in his rather is admittedly had a rather large garden but he worked out how many laps of his garden he would have to do to do the equivalent of this kill pilgrim walk and it was it was three thousand laps and what he did was he worked out well on the stopping stages of the real camino that would be equal to because the little bites little goals if he did 20 laps of his garden he knew on the spanish map where that had got to so he celebrated so he badged over six, six months he did his 3,000 laps of his garden. And each time he got to a significant part of the map on the real Camino, he'd have a little Camino party in his garden. Um, and he trained after that, it, the, the positivity, the experience, he then got to Spain and did the real deal. Um, and it's, it's on YouTube, it's called Phil's, Philip, Phil's Camino. Um, stock up on some serious amounts of handkerchiefs though because it is impossible to watch it with it you know he's so inspirational even talking about it now i'm kind of breaking up a bit uh because it was released at, a, at a, a medical conference i was presenting at and there was a room full of you know uh, clinicians doctors nurses physios OT, all manner and who, who are, we, we're kind of used to dealing with in, in tough circumstances yeah no one no one got through that without without weeping because it's so emotional and inspirational but it kind of shows somebody at their lowest physical ebb how yeah, they can you know um goal set do little things build it up achieve achieve things they never it was a, you know he'd never dream of doing a 350 mark pre prior to his cancer he never dreamed of of doing that but he'd set himself it as as a goal and i think my frustration i know whether giles has, has got any thoughts on this one of my frustrations with the post-traumatic um growth stuff is is it's, it's at the moment very descriptive and looking at really great examples where someone has become a new person and i'd love i'd love to see the research going into how can we distill that how can we coach that in somebody i think that's where that field kind of needs to go how what what what's the process to 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 facilitate that that uh, that transformation i think that's that's would be really interesting if that if that research can go in that uh, direction to help people park the old me and develop the um, the new me. Raj, could I add something yeah. about aphasia? Because yeah. when I was running the Speakability Helpline, I often used to have family members come onto the helpline and say to me that they were having trouble because the person wasn't the same person they were, that because their communication had been um, impaired, that they were struggling to see them as the same person. And that's a slightly different take on this question, I know. But, but one of the things that can help sometimes is for you 
as a couple or as a, as a family to do new things together. When we try new things, uh, say for example, if you're able to, you went and did some dancing or something like that, or you went to an art class, what you experience is that learning and doing together. So you laugh when it doesn't quite go right and you share that, oh, that the slight jealousy when the person who's over there can do it much better than either of you. And you start to get those kind of familiar, um, more informal type conversations and thoughts going, which can be really helpful when you are um, trying to, if you like, look forward and not backwards. So I would just encourage people, you know, in some ways you are exactly the same person. And what you're experiencing is that you can't enjoy or do some of the things you used to and that that feels now lost or not available to you. But there are a number of things, lots of things, if you look, that you could do together. And if you have a communication difficulty as well, looking at things that don't require you to speak, but perhaps require you to look at pictures or use pictures or use other mediums can be really important and can be um, good at bringing you back into yourself and developing those new skills or back into a relationship so that you can enjoy new things together. And along the way, you're going to make new friends and they're going to be people who didn't know you before you had your stroke. So they know you now exactly as you are for the person you are, the lovely person you are, the really important person you are. And in that way, you can develop a new sense of self, which I think is vital. That's a brilliant idea. Thank you so much, Mary. That's really cool. So Tinder, can I come to you finally? Yes. Um, well, first of all, um, adversity is how you really get to know yourself, you know. Um, I, I have been told by people that, you know, I am more empathetic and more caring and more positive than um, they think I would have been if I hadn't had a stroke. And these are patients and these are, are friends and colleagues. And, and they're probably right in some respect. But also, I know for a fact that, you know, the things I've gone through in life, and I've had several uh, significant health conditions and issues in my life as well, that have... And all I know is each time I've learned something about myself and at the end of it, I've come out and in retrospect, I've realized, you know, you should be quite proud of yourself, how you come out the other side of that. And in a way, I wouldn't have known that about myself otherwise. I mean, you can do your triathlons and whatever, but that that's quite one dimensional. What going through something like this does is it gives you a real sense of who you are. And the other thing it does is it gives you a real sense of perspective about life and the importance of it and the value of, of focusing and getting excited and not miserable about the right kind of things so that perspective has been so valuable for me in my life I mean I go to work you know most days of the week and I'm, I'm literally the only person who's always really smiley and chatty and I'm the one who's got the most fatigue the most physical pain the most etc cetera, etc cetera. but the reason I'm positive and chatty and happy is I'm just happy to be alive you know I my my expectations are really quite low if I can just get out in the garden and watch the birds singing and see a rabbit cro across the lawn that's made my day you know so I get excited and happy about things that really we should all get excited and happy about I don't get bogged down by the mundane things that people who haven't really had lots of adversity allow themselves to get bogged down by so in a way, you are in a, a good position to, to become that stronger person who understands yourself better out of what you've been through, you know. And also, you will gain, hopefully, when you look back, by keeping those diaries that we mentioned, hopefully you'll gain more self-respect. And one thing I'll guarantee you, you might not realise this, but you will certainly gain more respect from other people, definitely. Thank you, Satinda. That's kind of all questions, and I'm conscious of time. We've gone um, quite a bit over. Um, so unless there's any other comments from the panel today, 
Um, I'm going to thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a fantastic session again. Um, just I've been scrolling through the the chat um, and um, it, it's just great to see the comments that have come back. So thank you all so much for that. Um, I just want to sort of sum up now um, the conference because this is the last session. Um, it's been a fantastic week, um, a really engaging week as well. Um, I'd like to thank Bolt Burden Camp for being sponsors for the conference this week um, and for also for running the session this morning as well. Um, so thank you so much to, to those guys. Um, a huge thank you to all of our guest speakers. Um, without you, uh, we wouldn't be able to put on the conference. Um, and I've attended practically every session this week and read the comments that have gone through the chat sessions. Um, and every session has been so well received. So thank you so much to, to all of the guest speakers that we've had this week. Um, thank you for everyone, to everyone for, for joining in the week uh, and really for engaging with, with us. Um, conferences are, are great to attend, but really they're only really good when you get a great level of engagement from people. Um, and that's when you know that you're hitting the mark. And that's so um, very, very proud of um, everyone who's been, who's contributed towards that this week. Um, uh, and a huge thank you to um, Austin Willett, who's a CEO of Different Strokes, and to the team um, who've put on this week um, and, and done all the organising um, and made sure it ran as smoothly as possible. Um, and a special thanks to Lauren, um, who has had a, played an instrumental part um, to, to, to running the conference this week. So thank you. Um, I just want to end really on, on one thought that I think John touched on earlier as well. Um, and I was lucky enough to kind of hear or read the comment firsthand at um, uh, Claire from Physiofunctions um, talk. And it was really about this whole kind of thought about the fact that uh, consultants still today um, are saying to stroke survivors that, you know what, you, you, your recovery, you've pretty much hit it now and, and you know, there's not a lot more else we can do for you. So, you know, that's that's your job lot. And someone put a comment in and it was, a, it was about the, the fell walking example that John touched on. Um, and I think it was really pertinent and something that we bang on about to people to, for them to stop doing this. But and I've never been fell walking, but I, I, I totally understand and totally get this. So fell walking, he said, recovering from stroke is a bit like fell walking. Um, you think you can see the peak, um, but really it's just a sort of plateau. You stop, you look around, you have something to eat, something to drink, take in the scenery. And then you realize that, you know what, your journey hasn't finished. So you, you carry on going and so on and so and so on and so forth. And I think that's a really important analogy. Um, stroke recovery can and and we've seen it happen years and years uh, post stroke um so um please do continue to engage with different strokes with all the people around you stay positive and i look forward to hopefully seeing you all physically if not virtually very very soon thank you very much guys <laughs>